Warning. The following podcast contains two morons talking about sophisticated subject matter, like ninus and hoo-hahs. Also, a few whoopsie-daisies and at least one house or ante. If you don't have a strong stomach, you know where the door is. Right. On with the shenanigans, then. The podcast which you are about to hear is an account of the tragedy which befell two washed-up losers. In particular, Court Psyops and his immature co-host, Matt. It was all the more tragic in that they were uncultured morons. But had they lived very, very full lives, they could not have expected nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see each week. For them, an idiotic podcast show became a nightmare. The events of each week were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, Cinema Psyops, with Court and Matt. What is Psyops? Psyops, for psychological operations, is very simply the art of influencing how people feel and think and ultimately how they behave and what they do. You don't have to defeat the enemy on the battlefield. It's better if you can convince the enemy to do what you want him to do without having to fight him. And that's really the intent behind Psyops, to convince people to do what you want them to do. So how does PSYOPs fit into what's happening now? The two points I'd like to make with you and the audience is that, first and foremost, PSYOPs save lives. The second thing I'd like to say, a lot of people have misconception about PSYOPs. They think it's something deviant and brainwashing. you don't know exactly what's going on right now but we do know that there are some psyops going on right ma'am i don't know cinema psyops and i believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today why i believe that is because i know how it feels i know what it does to you cinema psyops they think it's something devious and brainwashing Welcome to the 298th consecutive week of Cinema PsyOps. I'm your host, Court, the guy that's super jazzed about being able to say pinky and not meaning the brain's sidekick. I'm <laughs> joining the cross the way, flubbing up my line and making me break my character is Matt, my co-host. <laughs> What are we going to do tonight, Bray? <laughs> Same thing we do every time we record, Matt. We're going to review a film, preferably with All right. In it. All right. See? Nothing wrong with that. All right. So, in the um, comparison things, I was alluding to people talking bad about, I, I don't know how to pronounce, Raika Ike? Raika Ike, I believe. Um, they're talking about, about her specifically. Our man in the field, Robert, has put up a beautiful post explaining that with the quotes and all of that kind of stuff. So uh-huh. upon the completion of the recording of this episode or somewhat during, depending upon what I feel like it, I'm going to run off and put that in the group announcements page to make sure that everybody gets to read it. I am by no means at all a expert in pinky violence or pinku aiga or pink films or Roman okay. pornos is what they are also referred to all over there. Um, wow, Roman pornos. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Just to kind of sum it all up and give you sort of like a, a, a litmus test, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Japanese films started including nudity and some of the more kinky sexual aspects, and it was usually like the super low budget films. They're called pink yeah. because of all the flesh that's on display, or is that's that's my understanding. There's not really like a universally agreed on definition. So yeah. what I always just assumed was they were very rudely saying pink as in to refer to the center of everyone's favorite uh, anatomy whenever you're watching women be naked, right? Yeah. But the yeah. Japanese Japanese films, they never show that. So are they talking about pink as in the areolas are always pink? Because that's not always the case. Yeah, uh, that's good. I don't know, man. The hell are you doing over there? The main thing to discuss here, though, is pinky violence or pinku aga or uh, the Roman porno films, whatever. It is like softcore porn type films with hardcore insane violence, at least in the pinky violence.
violence aspect of it. And then sometimes some more kinky stuff like uh, <clears throat> bondage, S&M, all that kind of shit. Yeah. Okay. That has been going on for quite a while. I mean, like we're talking, it started in like the late 60s, but really it kind of came to its end towards the late 70s. But the tradition is still there. They're still making the films. There's still stuff like this being made and released. It's just like the heyday. It's kind of like, you know, our sort of like porn grindhouse revolution thing. It could only really exist late 60s, early 70s, late 70s into the 80s. And then it kind of dies the same way that our home video market killed the grindhouse almost, or at least tried to. So it's kind of the same thing. But the main focus of Toei's particular pinky violence stuff is major badass fucking woman who just so happens to be the leader of an all-girl gang in a high school or involved in the Yakuza or is some type of like in some type of criminal underground element who literally waylays everyone in her path sometimes yeah. with shotguns which is still cool to watch on film I'm, I'm down sometimes with samurai swords as we're about to talk with sex and fury now the comparisons between lady snowblood and sex and fury are tantamount you can really see there's i mean the revenge the samurai part of it takes uh is it meja era they both take place towards the end of it or right after the wars that japan won and like the the birth of the nation kind of thing where it's starting to cross over into becoming a modern civilization because it's won these wars and it's on this high and all that crap, right? Yeah, we keep seeing that in a lot of these movies so far that we've done. Right. Is that this is right after the two great wars and that Japan's becoming modernized. Well, it's a very fertile ground for storytelling. It really, yeah. truly is. So, like, I completely understand that as well. Uh, the revenge aspect in this one is very different because the revenge is... Still, the person is searching, but it, it's not all consuming. They have a life. You yeah. know, Ocho yeah, they, has a life. She does. <laughs> and she seems to have joy in her life and some, you know, and things like that. She just so happens to be the ultimate fucking killing machine wrapped up in a tiny, beautiful fucking package that I can't stop staring at. <laughs> right? <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, and I'm I, listen. There, there's a good there's times. there's a grindhouse uh, database uh, website that has a bunch of stuff about pinky violence, Roman porno, those kinds of films. Has lists and all that kind of stuff. I'll put that in the group as well. Um, of course, there is because you know fucking internet. Yeah, but Pinku Aiga, as it's known, is essentially just a Japanese theatrical film that you know that definitely contains nudity or revolves around nudity. And thank goodness that the film we're talking about tonight involves. Raiko Aike. Again, I apologize. I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name right, but there we go. Uh, I can't fucking wait. Let's go fucking talk about this. This will keep it quiet. Oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You caught me cutting a new show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet. My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's the Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash legionpodcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. We appreciate it, and thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room.
everybody be cool. I found the soundtrack online and it's just too fucking good not to include. I want to try and pay as much respect and tribute to this film as I possibly can because, spoiler alert, I like this one more than the late yeah. movie, Snowblood movies. I'm sure everybody will figure out why once Matt starts his review. Uh, there is a trailer for this. Unfortunately, it is all foreign language, basically Japanese, except for a few of the scenes where Christina yeah. Lindbergh talks, but her Swedish accent is so heavy, I'm glad that they subtitled her in the yeah. subtitle file they, that we had. I almost clipped it, that. When he, <laughs> they spoke English to one another, uh-huh. and I, I was like, oh, wow, this is so weird. They, they do this in other countries' movies, you know, because in some of our movies in America, they will have scenes where two characters speak their own language, and we get subtitles for it. And I'm like, wow, they're doing it <laughs> in other cultures, movies, where there's two people who speak English talk to one another, and they have to subtitle it. <laughs> but, I just thought it was funny. <laughs> yeah, but it, like I said, it's kind of hard to understand her, and we'll we'll get into it a little bit more. Uh, and, and also, a lot of it was repetitive, so it just did not make sense to go ahead and clip this. I was just like, I'll just talk about it. Yeah, and instead of talking around the film, why don't we actually start the review? <laughs> yeah, let's fucking do it. So, Sex and Fury, first 20 minutes. We see a little girl is walking with her dad. Uh, she drops this ball, and then two dudes come up and just stab their er, her father. He asks if the reason they're killing him is because he's a detective. And they take his briefcase and they run away. He drops these cards, but he holds three. One a butterfly, one a boar, and one a deer. Uh, and then we go into the intro and it's kind of a badass little intro, honestly. It's really well shot. It has a great way of showing you everything you need to know about how our character, our main character of Ocho has grown up since she's witnessed her father's death. And you get the idea that she has basically turned a path to become a criminal and she's had no other choice. And that's how she's had to survive. And they do a great job of setting it up. I particularly love the visual of the snow falling that then turns into the cards. So it's always about these specific cards that her father was holding whenever he died. Yes. Specifically the three of the group, because they represent something very important to her. And the visual cues that this film gives you at the very beginning are very hip, very uh, like late 60s, early 70s, trippy, neat shit that they're coming up with. I really, really dig it. And it tells me everything I need to know about the character very quickly with just visual shortcuts, and I am very happy about that. Yeah, it's a it's a really fun way of uh, watching this. So, uh, or you know, visualization, and uh, you don't get a lot of good intros a lot of times with uh, a lot of movies we get to watch. So, what it shortcuts is all of her miserable past and all of the pain and suffering that she went through to get her to this place as the being an amazing fighter that Lady Snowblood dwells on for a long yeah. period of time. Now, I'm not saying that as a shot at Lady Snowblood. I'm just saying. They found a way of telling that same story, but because this one is not so focused on her misery, her anguish, and her hate, this one's more about let's have some fun, and oh, by the way, she's miserable, angry, and full of hate. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) So anyway, after the intro, uh, we are now in Japan. They have won two wars, they're now in the civilized era of enlightenment, and we see it's 1905. Yeah, they spend more time telling you about the history of Japan at this exact moment and are more careful about it than they are about the entirety of Ocho's life up to this point. Pretty much. Um, we see there's a new president in power, and he's meeting with his cabinet. As he meets with them, all of a sudden, this guy busts in and tries to kill the president. He fails. He, he's uh, somewhat injured. He gets sliced on his shoulder, but he's able to escape. Uh, as he runs away, uh, a young lady grabs him and kind of hides him behind, like, uh, in, in a little hut as people uh, walk by and uh, run by. Just then we see his helper come up and helps take him away as more they hear more cops around. What we see, she had accidentally stolen a little medallion, uh, it almost looks like a pocket watch, and inside is a picture of a young lady. Uh, she even makes mention that, you know, old habits die hard, that she's still doing this. So we see that her former profession has been a, as a thief. Well, this woman meets with a local gang leader, and she's looking for a man who's into racketeering. This lady, she has the same three cards that the guy who was killed had. And we find out her name is uh, Osio. Uh, and apparently she's great at uh, gambling. She's great at the game, and the crime boss wants to see her skills. 
Well, she's watching the game that's happening, and we see a guy is cheating. He gets caught and killed on sight. Well, she is examining some of his stuff and sees this bank document he dropped. It's a bank statement. Well, she runs to him as he's dying, and she tells him, uh, he tells her that the boss man actually told him to cheat, made him to do it. He asked that she give that bank statement to his sister, Yuki, in Japan, or she'll be slow- sold into a brothel. So then, um... Oh, no, she's already sold. It's a matter of he's oh. buying her back. Oh, okay. I, for some reason, I heard it as, read it as that if if she could get there in time, she won't be sold to the brothel, but she's kind of being held there. Her sister's in Hawk. Yeah. He's All selling right, his sister's ass that's... for money, and he's trying to yeah. get the pawnbroker to give the ticket back. That's That's right. Yeah, there you go. that's basically what's happening here. <laughs> that That's kind of what's going on, yeah. <laughs> so... Anyway, um, so later on that night, Oshio, she is taking a bath. Thank you, movie. Uh, she, yes, especially yeah. everything we're about to describe here. And don't step on it. I'm not. So anyway, as she gets a bath, she looks up and she sees these guys staring at her. She takes those th- little cards she has and whips it right into the guy's eye. Just then, a whole ton of dudes break in with the gang leader saying she has to die. Um, so she gets a sword and stark nude as days long goes on a fucking slice and dice spree that I can only assume has now become Court's most favorite scene in any movie ever made. Yes, I will save the breadth of my thoughts on this for the 20 for the, minute mark because we're really, really, really close. Yeah, you know what? I'm with you. Let me just say this. It is striking. It is awesome. She murders everyone without getting a cut on her and then kills the gang leader because, you know, fuck him. Yeah, uh, I, I, I want to dig into it, but I, I can't just yet. Um, but I do want to say that we are at the 12 minute mark when she is in the tub after all of the bad stuff happens and she gets put on the yeah. mission to go save that Yuki lady. Yep. And because she knows that that guy is a cheater, she's now a target. And yes. that's why this is happening story wise. Now, the yes, actual it's because the actual fan service of the shots i can't wait to do so let's move on <laughs> All right. So anyway, um, she gets to Tokyo. She sees a paper with the man's uh, face on it who she helped. His name is Sunshuski, and he is leading a revolt against the current government. He's another anarchist, pure and simple. Yeah. But he's also a revolutionary activist where he is trying to murder those in government that he feels are wicked or something along those lines or, or infringing upon it. So he's trying to kill the people he finds are tyrants. This yes. guy, apparently, this is a thing that he does. And I would argue that his failed attempts at assassination are comedic relief in this. Yeah, yeah. It's, but the real comic relief comes later because there, there's a funny kid in this. <laughs> yeah, but let's call him that. But we'll, yeah, yeah, let, right. let's get this 20 minutes going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then he shows up right behind her. She returns the medallion to him. And just then a girl bumps into him. And Osio, she goes after the girl grabs her and she had taken the wallet uh and she goes i know thieves around here then we see cops come running so he runs uh then a bunch of other women show up and they're all friends of Osio. and apparently they're all thieves she grew up with all these people learned how to be a thief and this young lady is brand new to the game well then she goes to meet the woman who took her in and as it's now becoming the anniversary of her father's death uh while the girls are talking this idiot kid shows up uh he says he wants to be a thief and he's ready to be a thief well he stole condoms and no one in the room knew what condoms were and one of the girls kind of knew and she called them rude sacks and now i'm always gonna call condoms rude sacks because that just seems best (laughs) he's Uh, also supposed to be comedic relief because he falls on his ass he thinks it's broken then he wants to make sure he can fart so he farts in his hand smells it he goes oh it smells bad so we're fine yeah he must be okay and then he tries to get some other chick to smell his fart too because it's still in his hand like I'm sure he's supposed to be comedic relief, but I just want him gone the entire time he's on screen. Pretty much. He annoys the fuck out of me. Yeah. But he also stole the condoms from the new girl who is now part of the team. So he sucks at everything. He should just be dead. Yeah. He is total comedic relief. I think all of the men are bumbling idiots in this movie. Yes, they very much are. Yeah. Uh, which it's real life. And by <laughs> I should the way, put that, that to men are bumbling idiots. Go ahead. Yeah. And then that ends the 20 minutes court. I give you the floor. First time I watched this film. Yeah. I said to myself, okay, samurai revenge flick, kind of not really my thing. By the way, I watched this before. I watched Lady Snowblood. I think I said that already. Yeah. I said, I will give it 20 minutes. 
and we'll see. If I get at least one good sword fight bout with lots of bloodshed like I've been promised, then I will give this movie more of a shot and we'll, we'll go the whole way. Let's let's give this a chance, right? Yeah, right. And I knew it was going to be a little sleazy because it was called Sex and Fury, so I knew that there was going to be some kind of like sexual component. Also, I was aware of Christina Lindbergh, who we need to mention is in this movie. Christina Lindbergh is a Swedish, I believe, born uh, softcore pornography actress as well, but more over there. Like There's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing at all. She is 100% a stunning, gorgeous sight to behold. Now, the way she got involved with this was some producers in the film approached her when she was in mid-flight to do a film in Japan. She agreed to it. She ended up here, and then she ended up doing another movie after that. Uh, but anyway, I was watching this because I knew Christina Lindbergh was going to be in it, and I was obsessed with Christina Lindbergh from Thriller and some of her softcore Swedish films that I'd also seen as well. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> but most of our audience is going to know Christina Lindbergh from there was a film that is beyond infamous in a uh, movie fanatic world known as Thriller colon A Cruel Picture. It's been released as and then also Thriller colon They Call Her One Eye. It's also been yeah. just released as They Call Her One Eye. I prefer the title They Call Her One Eye because that is like some severe fucking exploitation. Uh, Damn. The people that have seen Thriller A Cruel Picture know it is pretty gritty and pretty um, violent and rapey, but then also very much a rape revenge type film, but it takes the heroine a long time because she's addicted to heroin. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. It's, it's really grim and dark material to, to, to digest, and I absolutely love Thriller, do not get me wrong, but it is not a film for everyone, and I fully accept that. So, I was thinking that this was going to be the same kind of film as what Thriller was, and so I was giving it that 20 minutes. So, the gambling thing happens, that guy gets stabbed a bunch, I'm like, alright, so I guess you just gained a full half hour. I'm going to give you a little more time. We'll see what happens. The 12 minute mark hits. She's in the bathtub and I'm like, thank you, movie. I'm enjoying it. That guy opens up the vent so they can spy on her. She throws the card to blind the one dude. And then the next thing I know, a nonstop fighting sequence of her completely naked, slaughtering men left and right, getting sprayed with blood. And it's so gorgeously shot. The choreography is amazing. And I don't know if you noticed this or not, but in this particular particular film, none of the men that are facing her have any honor. None of them wait for her. None of them. In Lady Snowblood, there was still some traditional honor fighting where they weren't just sneaking up and trying to stab her from behind or or anything like that. They tried to do like a full frontal attack and, you know, that kind of thing, like where it was more of an honorable, you know, skill against skill alone. These motherfuckers are trying to desperately murder her in any way, shape or form that they can. But she is so good that stark fucking naked, she can mount a guy and stab him through the chest with all of his friends watching in fear in the fucking snow and do this amazing footwork that they show where it looks like she's barely even... No, she isn't. She's not even really touching the snow. I don't know if you noticed that or not, but she's not leaving footprints no, in the snow not. when she's doing it. Everybody else is. I mean, like they really took the time to do this shit and do it right. And it is like this fairy tale fucking samurai slaughter. But by the way, she's completely naked and all of the men are taken back by that and don't know what to do because they're all completely distracted and that sequence where she hops up after she stabs that guy and they do all that fancy footwork and she slashes a guy behind her that she's not even looking at and then gets sprayed across the lower back and buttocks with the blood that moment forth i was like i care nothing else that happens in this film i love this from here on out yeah like this was everything i was hoping for in an exploitation film all in one package and i was so ecstatic and i'm so heartbroken that this has still not gotten a high definition and transfer it's only on dvd everywhere like and i don't know if it will ever get one that breaks my heart <laughs> Oh, man. Just for this sequence alone, I need to see this in high def. I need to see this restored, man. Somebody out there, do something with this. Yeah. All right. Well, I that's, mean, it was fun. Yeah. The, the first 20 minutes really sets up the story really, really quite well. I, I And it sets a nice tone. I mean, you're going to have fun. Right. The, the entire time that you're watching the film, you know you're talking about dark subject matter. You know you're seeing dark subject matter. You know that bad things are going to happen to just about everybody that's in the film. Yeah. But even the music in the film and as we heard that i played it at the intro one of the earlier tracks that i believe is what they played over top of the intro of the film the entire film is setting up a we're gonna have a good time
time action movie. Oh, and by the way, there's going to be lots of nudity. Like, that's the way the theme plays. Like, when I think about exploitation, this is the kind of movie that pops into my head. Whether it's a Waka Jawaka, wah pedal, fucking guitar riff from a 70s movie, or it's this kind of like orchestral score with like a more modern twist to it and sound, and then lots of grotesque violence and nudity. I mean, that's kind of all I really need. And this, yeah, this, right? this film delivered it in spades, like right at the start of the movie to just kind of show you just how badass of a character she is. And then they're like, you, you're pronouncing it Osio, right? Because that's how it sounded. O- Ocio? Yeah, Ocio. Yeah, Osio is o- what I'm trying to do. Osio or Ocio. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. just going to call her Ocho because it's easier for me. And that's I was about to just call her Ocho as well. Yeah. It's you just, know what? She's the Ocho. She's Ocho for me. That's, that's yeah. you know, I right, can't. I'm going to call her. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with Ocho as well. I can't fucking <laughs> pronounce this stuff otherwise. And I fully admit that. And I apologize. I I feel it would be worse if I tried than if I just pronounced a word that I knew that I could when I was referring to her. That's why I've always called her Ocho. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right from the start, because I just never even thought of it any other way. But they, they show Ocho as a badass. And then the rest of the journey is going to be this sort of like interpersonal drama where she starts to suss things out. And it's a little bit of a detective story where she's trying yeah. to find out what's going on. And, and also she's trying to do this little hero's journey to save this one girl, Yuki, and maybe get her a fate that's not as bad as what Ocho survived. So cool. Yeah. You know, that's that's what we've got set up here. And I'm like, okay, well, you gave me all this fucking front loaded violence and bloodshed and nudity all in one gloriously shot package. I just sit back, I relax, and I let the rest of the movie wash over me until the violence or nudity hits again. Yes, of course. Yeah, I mean, and it's so that that whole fight scene was well choreographed too. I mean, forget the fact that she's naked, which is really cool. I mean, Jesus Christ, how awesome was the just the fight scene of it <laughs> well and the way they filmed it too if there was even a hint of pubic hair in the shot or of female nethers in the yeah. shot the entire shot would be ruined that sequence yes, because a exactly. lot of it is held in one shot for a lot of the mm-hmm. stuff that she's doing in the camera and i believe that the reason that they show her footwork and then the dude's just falling down dead is because that's easier to shoot for a good amount of the fight for the deaths And then also they don't have to worry about the actress turning or standing too far with her legs apart to where maybe some light could creep up and you could see a a hint of it because that would be a major no-no. Yes. Still kind of a major no-no over there, I believe, because they still blur stuff out like pubic hair and shit, right? I I believe you're right, yeah. Yeah, so, but the way that they shoot that, and it's a lot of it is one shot. There there are some cuts, but a lot of it is one shot. It's so masterfully and so beautifully done. Like, you know, this is where they spent the bulk of the time. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah, just an awesome way to, to get a movie started, right? Well, yeah, we but, obviously can't stop fucking talking about it, even though I've signaled we're going to go into the next 20 minutes. Yeah, so, yeah. All right, all right. We're going to the next thing. We're there. <laughs> <laughs> but when is now? When will then be now? Now is Soon. then. Yeah. So, all right. So, okay. So, Ocho, at the start of the next 20 minutes, Ocho meets with the pimp. He says he claims he doesn't know a Yuki. But then this big boss shit stain, is what I call him, comes up. And he says there's a lot of dock. He tells the pimp that there's a lot of dock work coming. He's a con- He owns a construction company. And that, you know, a lot of that work will come his way. And he wants the new girl because he wants to deflower her because he says that is his hobby. So, he's a shit stain and he's fucking gross. Oh, and Ocho was trying to make the deal for that same girl Yuki from the same guy who flat out lied to her and said that there is no one here of that name. Yep, exactly. So everyone's a shit stain and Ocho should just start hacking away at everybody. Uh, (laughs) Pretty much everybody that's male in this story, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, the girl is... Yugi, we see, and before he can deflower her as he's starting to get rapey, Ocho shows up with the cash to redeem her. He's pretty much, no, we're not going to do that. She kind of tells the story and everything, what's happening, so that he sees the callus on her hands and knows she's a gambler. So he proposes a gamble game uh, against a western lady gambler who's one of the best. If Ocho wins, she gets Yuki. If he wins, he gets them both. So, uh, this guy is obviously fucking gross, and he should die soon. Yeah, he's dealing with women as if they are a commodity and not a human being. This is a flesh peddler, and or he looks as women as property or notches on his bedpost. That's why he definitely he's... looks at them as, as property. Yeah, and or notches on his bedpost. All he really cares about is the fact that this is a girl that he will deflower, and he wants to do it violently, and he wants to ruin it so her first time will 
will forever be marred by his disgusting ass. That's what he gets and, off on. But in his mind, he'll think she'll always love him for it because he's he's supposed to be God's gift to women, apparently. Yeah, he's a fucking so. textbook narcissist. He might as well have a blonde wig and an overpriced suit that's ill-fitting with a tie that goes down to his fucking knees. Am I wrong? Yeah. <laughs> Nope, not at all. <laughs> so then we cut to uh, we. There's this big ball, and this guy announces that the number one dancer out of London comes in. This girl has a name. It's Christina. I know that now, but I'm only calling her London throughout the rest of the goddamn movie. Which is the actress we've discussed a little bit earlier. That is Christina Limburg, and, and her she, name is actually Christina in the movie as well. Right, and she is 100 percent just striking to look at yes she really is yeah that is very true she is captivating and when she is naked even more so and good lord i need to stop talking about my crush on christina Lindbergh. this is gonna start getting creepy <laughs> um so ocho and her they start playing some uh five card draw yeah uh, from what i can see uh we start out with some very really simple hands here uh, i wrote down actually one of the first hand ocho holds a, a pair of queens with uh with a chance at a straight while uh london she holds uh, two pair jacks and eights and she wins that first hand but then ocho wins the second hand and it goes back and forth then right when it looks like ocho's in trouble the london has a full house while ocho really has bumpkiss right as it looks like she might be in a lot of trouble for a good amount of her chips a fucking fight breaks out as uh, Shuru and his dudes all break in, start fighting, looking to kill the president. Well, they all get into the main ballroom area. The president is behind London, and she takes out a gun and starts shooting all the guys' hands. Not killing them, but shooting their hands so they all have to drop their swords. She's doing, she's a, a crack shot, and then she sees Shu. And she's, she freezes up, and we see that she is definitely the girl from in his locket. Uh, they both stare at each other, and a guy behind her is telling her to shoot, shoot. She shoots at the floor. Before anything else can happen, more police break in, so Shu and his guys run off. And they set the game back up, but we can tell London is completely out of it. She's thinking about Shu, thinking about all the time they spent together. We see visions of them making out. She is sweating like a motherfucker. And we see Ocho starts winning, starts winning. Finally, she thinks she has Ocho right where she wants her. She has four kings, but then Ocho lays down four aces and wipes her out and wins the game. So Shitstain says then he will release Yuki to Ocho at noon. Uh, London and Ocho shake hands as a, you know, congratulatory thing to each of them. And when Ocho leaves, Ocho has stolen London's gun out of habit. So then, Shitstain says, I will let you go at noon tomorrow. He's talking to Yuki. He goes, but not before I deflower you. And he rapes Yuki that night. He has this shit, he says, that will turn her into a nympho when he rubs it on her. And it's fucking gross. And um, he, he's a fuck. And we see on his back, there's a tattoo of a deer. So, Which is exactly like the ones that was on the cards. We've kind of figured yes. it out, but let's just yeah. flat out state it right here. His She's looking for three people who have three different tattoos of the three cards her father held up to her when he died because he knew the people who killed him yes so then yuki wakes up and she's with ocho so ocho must have picked her up but she's having nightmares she can't sleep ocho confirms the fact that yes yuki was raped um she tells ocho about the deer tattoo on his back so that gets ocho really up there uh did you notice how um the actress's facial expression changes ever so subtly but she yeah. does like this real like hateful micro expression that she then oh, she gets like a crazy look in her eye too like it's time to die like great i have my first lead in killing this asshole let's do it you know it's like the kind of look that you get the very first time when uh your mom tells you don't you fucking do it like because you're about yeah. to get something bad to happen uh -huh. like back yeah. in the day when your parents could smack you and get away with it my, or, or my parents yeah <laughs> or the first time as a kid you ever looked at your mom and said shut up and that's the look you get and you're like oh fuck <laughs> i may have uh I may have done poorly here. Yeah, if no <laughs> one made a bad decision, if if no one ex has ever experienced that before, it's um, yeah. it, it's like the first time you ever hear a riff from Tony Iommi, like when the hair stands up on the back of your neck and you feel like you're in danger. It's that feeling, and that's exactly what she evokes with just a simple look. And, yes. and even when she's being sympathetic in her vocal tones, talking to the girl to get more information, 
That crazy look doesn't fucking leave, and it's uncomfortable. Yeah, no, yeah, it's 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 there, man. It stays, and you feel every little bit of it. That's for damn sure. So she's not consumed <laughs> by her vengeance, but it's definitely there. That drive, that hate, everything that we saw in Lady Snowblood's character is still in this woman, but she's a more rounded human being who is existing. She's not living for revenge. She's living yeah. so that she can get her revenge. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, yeah. And and she tells even y- Yuki wants to kill herself. And she tells her, you know, there's plenty of time to die, but you only get to live life once. So you can tell it's not like um, it's not like Ocho's on a suicide mission. She obviously likes and she enjoys living life. She This is almost just like something she just has to get done. I think she also has a little bit of a thrill seeker, like um, the more hard or difficult a task is the more intrigued to try it she is. I mean, common for a thief. Right. Like, that's kind of what I was getting Get that at. that little thrill. Yeah. So I think the the killing stuff that she does, like that whole slaughtering of the bad guy, I don't think yeah. she needed to do that. She could have just quietly disappeared and gone somewhere else and, you know. Yeah. She purposely drew them in by making herself look weak by being naked and bathing. She, of course. She knew they were coming for her, and she did that to get them off guard. So yeah. she's a very cold and calculating person, but at the same time, she has a lot of warmth and care for this individual who has suffered a horrific assault and yeah. is so gentle with her and really is just, you get the sensation she's been there and she's just trying to tell her, hey, that was just your body. That wasn't you. That was just your body. Very much so you get that feeling that she, she kind of knows what these streets are like. So Yeah, I, I would not be surprised that at some point, probably when she was still extremely young something like that happened to her and yeah. that drove her to become even more of a fighter or something along those lines but the movie doesn't bother with going into this like seriously tragic backstory they just allow the actress to play it out on her face when she's talking to poor Yuki here and just yeah. they just kind of allow the story to kind of unfold as is and you just kind of get that inclination because how else would she have ended up where she currently is and how she's currently like this ultimate badass that she is if she hasn't had a very shit life to drive her to it yeah exactly so anyway uh that's a lot to talk about from a quick little scene like that but i guess it was an important scene it's loaded um, it's very yeah. loaded with stuff and the more i watch the interaction between these two actresses the more i see things like that in it i really do feel that there's a lot that this movie has to convey and i think it's really unfairly maligned just because there's a lot of fucking in it yeah exactly so um that's what i was so up in arms about earlier yeah london and then we cut to the London girl. She is sitting there. And she's reflecting on what it was like seeing Shun. And then the dude who kind of introduced her all that, he walks in behind her. They are apparently actually secret agents. And it's their job to set up a opium war in Japan. Um, but uh, he's pissed. And he checks out her locket and sees a picture of Shun in there. So he knows that she knew him. Then says, you know, you're so lost. You even got your own gun stolen. And then he decides to rape her. And she then has a monologue where she's like, I learned to be through being a a spy uh, that I can detach my mind from my body. So she just kind of leaves while he fucking rapes her. And that closes out that 20 minutes. And that's fucking gross. All right. There is a downside to Pinku Aiga, Roman Porno, and Pinky Violence Films. Unfortunately, and I have no idea why this is, it just fucking is, a lot of the sex in them is going to be sexual assault. Yeah, there's. it seems that way. A lot of it. And depending upon the film, it might be predilected upon that. That might be the whole, whole of the tale in some of these films. So there are landmines like that in, in Pinku Cinema. Pinku Aiga well, Cinema. <laughs> it, seems, it seems to be that way in, uh, in a lot of these films, like these type of uh, films. Yeah. So. <laughs> Exploitation films really do use rape excessively so in a lot of cases. Um, There's got to be another way to do character development or to show someone is a despicable human being for wanting to do something along those lines. And if you're doing it for titillation, um, I think you're sending the wrong message as is. This is stuff we've already kind of discussed. Uh, This particular rape sequence with Christina Lindbergh is particularly egregious for myself in that 
she goes somewhere else. She dissociates from it, but then the movie shows her enjoying it and engaging in it and allowing it. See, at one it point, like, being... moan, yeah, th- that got really weird, but then she, like, talks about how she just kind of dissociates her mind from it all so that it all kind of, so, you know, she maybe doesn't, I don't know, piss them off more. I don't know, like, to, because they have to learn how to do it, you know, because of their training. It's just all bad. Whatever it was, this particular scene was significantly more egregious. Um, the What happens to Yuki is, thankfully, a a lot less involved right. in sexuality, but the entirety of Christina Lindbergh's scenes revolve around her in situations where she is having sex, not willingly, and then it turns into willingly, <laughs> where she's being assaulted, but then decides she likes it in a lot yeah. of cases. And Ugh. this is the hardest thing to process in this movie for me. Um, yeah. It is really hard to, to to sort of deal with, particularly because I've already seen a movie where she gets fucking <laughs> brutalized by people for like a good portion into the movie and hooked on drugs and I just watching it again makes me flash back to that. Oh, God, <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. But thankfully after this scene, the sexual assaults go away. We don't have to deal with them anymore for the yeah, rest of the movie. Yeah, this is kind of the end of that. So, And when I was watching this again, I always forget about them because obviously the thing I always remember is the she's bathing and then slaughters a bunch of dudes and then the fights at the end that we'll talk about when we get there. Um, I forget about this part in the middle and honestly, I don't even really think about the sex part that's in the film that much. I just yeah. think about the slaughter and the nudity while slaughtering <laughs> <laughs> sequences <laughs> with uh, <laughs> right, right. Okay for us so i mean you know like when i've totally selected this i, I should have warned you like I, when i was watching it and both those scenes happen i'm like eh, he'll be fine it wasn't that brutal he's seen worse it wasn't yeah i mean i've seen worse so you yeah. know i and also you go into some of these things prepared so yeah. i um, i would say that the next time that we are doing a sexualized samurai film like any kind of pinky violence or pinku aiga film like if you get the sensation that that is what we are covering which i will more or less probably tell you yeah. <laughs> or try to give you a heads up on then yeah you could probably expect some kind of grotesque sexual assault at some point to varying degrees at how grotesque it's going to be yeah it's kind of what I, I i figured that yeah <laughs> it's 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 not my thing man thanks anyway movie but no thanks i, I fleshed that one out uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, not some comfortable. Let's get into the fun stuff to talk about in this movie because there All is right. plenty more coming. So the next twenty starts out with Shitstorm meeting with the president. Um, the president decides to go take a bath, and then Shitstain and the president's wife. We find out they're having an affair. They hook up and they bone. After they're boning, they're having quote unquote pillow talk. We find out that uh, the wife, the president's wife, is Ocho's mother and the wife of the cop that was killed. Uh, she kind of looks off in the distance and just says she wants to die. Um, so she, you can tell she's not really enjoying life. Uh, but apparently she's always been kind of uh, a philanderer, I guess. Uh, this guy's known her since before she was married, so... Because the guy even says, you know, you you have more, of, you have too much of an appetite for just one man. You never should have married that poor cop. So maybe the guys that murdered her husband did it for her. Who knows? But the thing that they're they're doing here, where she's Ocho's mother, but also just abandoned her daughter and left her alone with the father, and then the father ends up murdered. So like she doesn't even like Ocho doesn't even uh, no, know. No, you get a you get a flashback. She was there when the father was murdered. All right, I was trying to leave that out because we haven't seen it oh, yet. But no, that, that happens right here you okay. see that flashback happen just now cool in so, this scene okay so, so she's we're cool yeah <laughs> all right so we know that she's a part of it and we know that he knew her back in the day and we already know yeah. that he has one now, of the we tattoos. don't know if she's a part of it or if she just saw this guy get her husband get killed and now she's hooked up in this life of just killing herself kind of you know this is what we, we know we don't know she anything else watched this man brutally murder her husband with a group of yeah. other men and is now sleeping with him so yes. clearly while she may not be involved she's very much okay with it now here's the here's the feeling i got is that these th- this guy the three she's looking for didn't directly kill her uh, uh, oh the three that ocho are looking for didn't directly kill th- her father but they sent the men to kill her father because we get a good look at these men and they look nothing like the men they are now. So, and they look much older back then. So it's almost like she's looking for the three men who sent the hitman to kill her father is what I got out of it. Okay. I always just assume they were the same guys and this is how they made their bones. Yeah. 
I, I mean, could be, but I think they'd already made their bones and they just, they just tired and, or told some guys cause uh, the cop was getting too close to something to go ahead and kill. Well, uh, even though you didn't do it yourself, if you still request someone do it and pay them to do it, you, you, you are you still are, a murderer. You're still yes. legally culpable for what yes, has happened. You are still a murderer. You, you murdered, you done, you done did murder. Right. <laughs> exactly. And if you try to hire someone and then they turn out to be like an under cover cop and you go to jail for it then you yeah. can get out and sing with your metal band later but you're still an attempted murderer <laughs> that's right god damn it yeah tim but, i'm looking know. at you you fucker yeah asshole <laughs> <laughs> but anyway uh just to kind of come back to this what i'm basically hinting at is she knows this guy fucking killed her husband or had her husband killed or whatever and she's still fucking him now yeah she has to have an idea that this guy was involved right so she has to know so she's ocha's mother and she's involved in some way shape or form or at least knows and or condoned it which is yes. still not fucking cool the story continues to get dark but it does it in such a fun way yes um well then we see sean has a meeting uh and they're trying to decide when to strike next. Well, we see a man is watching them. Well, um, then uh, the president, uh, Shitstain, they're both having a meeting with the commissioner about stomping out these you know, renegades and anarchists. Well, the guy comes in and says, I, I found their meeting place. So the next thing we see is cops breaking in. Uh, Shun is still able to escape, and he runs into Ocho's kind of place, and she hides him. The cops get there, and the other women stop him, say, you know, only women can come in here. And then that stupid kid pops up and goes, yeah, only women can come up in here. And th that was just dumb. Well, then he tries uh, to say that he's gay to get away gay. with it, but it's, yeah. Yeah. it's it's an attempt at humor to be some comedic relief, and yes, it does not work for me, but I can see where someone would probably find this guy hilarious. I mean, you know, maybe for the back of the day, that was funny. You know what I mean? And we could also chalk it up to a cultural thing, like maybe just yeah. the way that he's all goofy and silly is funny. Funny, you know, culturally speaking, or maybe everybody thinks this guy's fucking annoying. Yeah, maybe. Maybe this is their Jerry Lewis. Who knows? <laughs> so the French will find him a genius and no one else. Yes, exactly. Now you're getting it. So anyway, um, then uh, we see kind of Shun and Ocho are hiding in this shed. And Shun tells a story to Ocho of how there is evidence um, against the president and this business guy years ago that would have taken him down and they never would have came into power. But, uh, that evidence was stolen from a detective who was murder, who they had murdered. Um, the, uh, that's the evidence that would destroy them. And of course this makes Ocho very interested because that's her father. Um, they, he says, then Shun says, then after they got that evidence, they killed his father, who was president at the time, to take power. Uh, then they have a little bit of a moment where it seems like they, they may be getting romantical. But um, then uh, then we see that the uh, a gang led by the, the pimp break into Ocho's lady place where all the thieves live. <laughs> lady and place. Lady, well, I, don't, I mean, I don't know. It's all women who are supposed to be there. It's a <laughs> and, and ladies hostel and or a brothel. I'm not sure which. I don't think it's a brothel because none of them are having sex. They're just thieves. So it's a ladies hostel of thieves. Yes, something like that. And they grab all the girls, string them all up in a room and start beating them. Well, Ocho shows up with a gun. One guy, she has a hostage. One guy tries to shoot at her. And like an awesome thing, she, uh, or one guy throws a knife at her. And like a great thing, she shoots the knife. I was like, that's fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah, she shoots the knife out of the air as it's hurled at her. Like almost instantly. Yeah. His arm goes and she moves real quick and then puts the gun back on her hostage. Like it's nothing. Like it looks at the guy like what else you got yeah well, what, else, what else you gonna do bitch <laughs> so um after that uh they all she's like if you let my girls go you can have me so he obviously agrees and lets all the girls go and then they're all like getting ready to they want to torture her and she goes i'd rather have shit stain take care of me so he comes from behind the wall because she knew he she she knew he was there um and so uh then they cut to they're in bed together she's nude and she says she wants to apply some perfume well she goes into the restroom and she takes out this thing from her hair and it's this little jar of stuff she's really rubbing it into her skin and wow they 
they take a moment to show her rubbing this stuff into her skin. Yeah, thank you, movie. Uh, this is a wonderfully romantic thing for you to do for me. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it's, it's really nice, isn't it? Everyone's having a good time. Uh, <laughs> I believe the only people that are not having a good time here would probably be the kind of folks that don't want to see this lovely actress perform this intimate moment for us. Yeah, right. Like, if um, they're just not into what she has to offer, let me just put it that way. Uh, I'm going to put sure. it as delicately as possible. Then they probably yeah. won't enjoy this as much. But for sweeps broadly to everyone else that possibly could enjoy such a thing, yeah. uh, the rest of us are just fine. <laughs> we're, we're very yeah, The rest happy. of us are we're doing okay. <laughs> this, is, this is gorgeously shot, and yeah. she expertly displays her body. And good Lord, is it titillating. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Yeah, it, I mean, it really is. You're not wrong. Not wrong at all. <laughs> this uh, actress, again, I can't, I'm just going to probably mispronounce her name, and I'm so sorry, but Raiko uh, Ike is absolutely stunning, and she puts in the work for all of the choreography and the fighting, and I just, I got to see more of her stuff, right? We got to do more of right? her stuff on this show. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Agreed. And Agreed. I, I know that, we need more stuff. I know that our one listener who will stick with us through thick and thin, Robert. The one listener we got. <laughs> the one we know for sure is out there if we keep putting out episodes. So it's Robert, our man in the field, yeah. also has a thing for her, which is huh? which is partially why we had the write ups that we got from him on this. He's <laughs> quite the fan, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so there we go. <laughs> there we go. And if anyone needed to find a reason, um, well, the naked slaughter and bathing scene should do it. But if that's not your thing, like if women covered in blood doesn't do it for you, there's this sequence, and this should pretty much seal the deal. This really should. So uh, he actually opens up the door and sees. I think it's the same vilest stuff, or at least the vial is the same, of the stuff he used on Yuki, which drives him crazy. And so he gets her on the bed and starts kissing her and everything and starts going all over. And then when he actually starts going down on her, he starts choking. Um, apparently, it's a poison from Germany is what she put on herself. Uh, How did that so, not poison her? Or did she take the antidote? Maybe she took an antidote, or maybe you have to ingest it orally for the poison to work. It won't absorb through the skin. But she put it on her vagina so that when he started licking at it, it would poison him. Maybe or she put it on the outside, not on the inside. But depending upon his technique... <laughs> Well, maybe, you know, he's a selfish man, so maybe the technique ain't all that great. Okay, let's just say <laughs> that she has spent years building up a tolerance to Iocane powder. Yeah, yeah, okay, I mean, why not? It would be worth for the Dread Pirate Roberts. Right, so let's just say that's the case, that she has a natural immunity to the poison and uses this tactic specifically to kill men, yeah. um, you know, like in a very personal manner. I would say that this particular revenge is extremely brutal. Oh, yeah. Well, anyway, um, she demands to know where the butterfly and the boar are. And he says, you'll find out, you know, when, when it's time and you'll enjoy it. And he kind of has the last laugh after he gets done, you know, puking up blood and then he dies. So shit stains at least gone. I also feel that the reason she killed him in the manner that she did is more for avenging what happened to Yuki. Yeah, I think so as well. well I think she, she wanted to make a him... card of the deer on his body as well. I think she wanted him to suffer specifically. Yeah, instead of just a quick stab, she wanted him to choke in his own fucking blood and die. Like, and I enjoy it. She kind of knows that the deer is a man and she knows sort of who or she knows the deer and she knows sort of who the boar is but there is another um the bird is the one that she has no idea who that is but the boar she has a good idea or at least knows where they are you know like what underworld that they run and she knows that he's in this town he just she just doesn't know who he is and then the bird she has no fucking clue who they even are and the guy yeah. the guy says that when she finds out it's going to be fun for her yeah so i mean good times have by all right there right <laughs> sure Every, everyone's enjoying life now. So, um, uh, so then, uh, we cut to, uh, the, uh, London is sit standing there and her handler or spy leader is talking to her and saying, now it's time for her to use her spy work and her body to get some documents they need from the president. Uh, meaning the producers feel like you need to do another sex scene. Pr pretty much. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what that would usually translate to <laughs> if I had to, you know, guess money on that <laughs> uh <laughs> so uh she's then as they ride to the president's place she's just thinking of shun 
and wants to see him one more time. It kind of sounds like she why she does what she does. So, uh, oh, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> she flat know, out I, says she became a spy to try and find him, and that's why she took this mission, is yeah. to try and find him, but it's also been the biggest regret of her life, I think. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Something along so, those lines, but like it's really kind of hard to understand what it is that they're yeah. trying to do here, and this feels like well, padding. The, the president, yeah. The president and the guy, they make a deal. He tells the president, uh, the main, the handler, tells the president that London will give her all. You know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, know what I mean? And then that takes us, we're going down to the final 30 minutes. So anything you need to add to this before we uh, end all this? (laughs) No, because I was going to say, like, there's a sex scene that's kind of coming up. But then after that, it's like, boom. The last, like, 20-ish minutes of this is just nonstop. Go, go, go. Yeah. Agreed. It's going to be, we're going to go. Yeah. Well, the, the sex scene that we were talking about, this was probably the contractual obligation that she appear in two different sex scenes, one of them yeah. involving other women and a possible three-way, which we're about to get to and discuss. Um, but I really want to get to the, the final fights and everything and we'll do final thoughts over the overall thing for the movie, but trying to sum them up at the very, very end, I don't think we're going to be able to do because we got to dig into each individual action sequence piece Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. So, all right, let's go. All right. So then um, the president's wife uh, takes uh, London, uh, who's all done up now, to the president. The wife and London make out in front of him. They undress each other and they just go at it right in front of the president. Just going at it. Then the president jumps in as well and he, he gets his piece. And uh, we see the president has a, a boar on his back. So we know he needs to be next in line to die. Uh, all the while this is going on, we see Shun is spying on him and he sees this whole thing happen. Um, later on, the Prez is laying down with London and, uh, the wife walks in and says, tells Prez about how shit stain is dead and that Ocho did it. They both leave and London lays there and Shun shows up. He says he's there to kill the president. Well, she tells him that she needed to find him and see him again. Last time they were together, she got pregnant. But he wouldn't stay, of course. He had to do things for his country. And she says how she just she just hated him for it. Hated him for leaving. But then she also sees that he still carries her picture in the locket. She tells him that they could run away. They have a whole life they could live. They could do this. But he says he must kill the president first. So she says to do it, do it tomorrow on the train when only I'll be guarding him. Well, then Shun uh, leaves and he meets up with Ocho. She says that uh, he, he tells her to let him... Like, he tells her about the boar tattoo, but says, let him kill the president. She says, no, she must kill the boar and then the butterfly. She's already dealt with the deer. So then Ocho and Shun both go to kill the president on the bus. And as they're trying to go, uh, Ocho runs out of bullets in her gun. They're fighting, and all of a sudden, all these nuns stand up with fucking knives on them. And so it looks like it's to be a setup. Uh, Shun is, uh, uh, wrestling with the guy and he gets thrown from the train and then London pistol whips Ocho. Then we cut to Ocho is chained in a dungeon and we see she's just getting regularly whipped by London. Just whip and whip. And then she gets strung up. Um, can we just, can we just talk she... about this sequence, please, for just a minute? Go can ahead. We, can we... I know you're yeah. you're uncomfortable describing it, okay? But I'll, yeah, I'll, you go ahead. I'll do I'm, this for you. I'm not you. good with this. Okay, this is by far definitely a perfect example of the BDSM kind of thing that would end up in a pink. Pinku Aiga or Pinky Violence kind of film. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, like I said, I haven't seen a ton of these, but the ones that I have seen, this so beautifully captures it. They have chains wrapped around her almost like a tied up like rope technique where you accentuate or you know make breasts swell up red with the the nodding and stuff so they have the chains around her chest in that manner to pull her breasts forward and pinch them and all that kind of stuff and you can see where they actually are like like the links are like pinching flesh and stuff like to make it hurt that much worse like it's very obvious and that's how she's hanging from these chains they're whipping her with like uh wires right like it's like like it looks like boar's hair or like a horse hair but or wire almost you know like it's that kind of like a like like the kind of thing that they use to keep flies you know they use a horse's tail to like scare flies away but it's like made out of wires yeah. whatever it is it's ripping the shit out of her flesh every time it hits her christina Lindbergh's character is fucking whipping her and she's wearing a leather fringe cowgirl kind of outfit yeah. 
that looks yeah, it's real- almost like she's a part of the Wild Wild West right now. But it's like also this, um, like sort of like a Native American style of fringe over the leather like dress that you would have seen. But like, let's it's say what super it is. Short. She has a whipping outfit. She has a whipping outfit. Right, and that's what it's specifically. It's like a fetishized whipping outfit, and they're shooting her from below so that you can see right up the top in the fringes that are coming yeah. around, and it's very sexualized. And goddamn, that was working for me. And uh, <laughs> so she's being, you know, she's brutalizing uh, Ocho to this. And then all of the nuns that turn out to not be nuns, but are like this hired army, like defense, they're sitting and watching and enjoying it quite a bit underneath their uh, outfits there. Um, I don't know if you get what I'm meaning. I thought they yeah. were touching themselves while they were watching I, that. They, they might have been. Yeah. I mean, just because I was doesn't mean that they can't. Um, <clears throat> and then they are sh- watching this and they're orgiastic and then they continue to whip her and then they do the shots of Christina Lindbergh from underneath and they just keep going around and they're like the really sexually charged scene that must have made you so uncomfortable that you just skipped all of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. If I didn't love the movie before this sequence was like all kinds of weird kink and just like eye opening gloriousness where I was like this movie fucking rules. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was completely in love with this in, in this sequence because it's just this so bizarre thing that I have never seen before in my life and I loved it. <laughs> so I wanted to point that specific sequence out. We cannot not talk about that right as it's happening. I'm sorry. We have to. That's That was yeah. insane. I mean, that whipping sequence? Yeah. If you don't talk about it, I don't know who we are anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's filmed it with all these weird Dutch angles and is really hallucinatory and kind of unsettling, but like at the same time, not. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it, it reminded me of some of the stuff in Ken Russell's like the devils and things in some s- certain aspects of it where it's filmed in such a way to where I feel like I'm losing my own grasp on reality. <laughs> yeah, right. Which yeah, it, I mean, it was a weird thing. Yeah, it's almost like you're in one of those psychedelic trips. Right. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy about this film. We didn't talk about that a lot, but even in the fighting sequences, it goes into this very psychedelic hallucinatory territory, even with the music. Yeah. And I really fucking dug it. All right. I'm, I'm good with that sequence. If you can find <laughs> your place where you were. <laughs> um, all right. So we see Ocho's kind of uh, strung up and her mother comes down, the pres wife. She confirms to her that, yes, she is her mother. And cuts Ocho down and starts untying her. But as she's doing that, she's caught by the president. So he makes mom go ahead and get nude and then showers her with hot water. And that melts away almost makeup on her back, exposing a butterfly tattoo. Mom was in on it. Mom set up her husband to get murdered. And the pres even tells Ocho that he had known her mother since even before she had met her father. So, uh... And all the while, she's trying to come up. She always has a different excuse each time for why she set up her husband to get murdered. And finally, Ocho tells her just to pretty much fuck off. Uh, While the Prez picks up his wife, chokes her out, beats her, then chokes her again until he kills her. Um, That was a hard sequence to watch. Yeah, that was rough. That was rough. Um, then we cut to Shun and London find each other at a train st- station. Um, Shun's like, oh, you got my letter? And she goes, I-, I don't know what letter you're talking about. And they see they're in and a trap. And they were tricked there. And s- the spy handler and others are shooting at them. With the spy handling telling London that she has to die because they know all their secrets. Well, she is able to shoot one of them dead. And he's able to cut some down. But then he gets shot in the chest. Uh, as she runs up to him, she gets shot in the chest. Um, he's able to pick her up and try to walk away with her, and Spy Handler shoots him a couple times. Uh, and as they both lay there dying, he goes to check out his handiwork, and she's able to grab Shun's sword, and in her dying breath kind of stabs the guy, killing him. And they both lay there on the ground. They kind of try to hold hands, and they just die. This was so a very that, Romeo and Juliet yeah. sort of thing that they were trying to do with them. Uh, this whole That's true. The, the whole love story between the two of them feels like it's shoehorned in to give Christina Lindbergh a, a little bit more of a shot to do what she needs to do. And her yeah. her character was clearly shoved in by the producers because they wanted to put her into the film. Like, but you could completely excise all of her sequences and just make anybody be the person that she gambles against and all that kind of stuff. 
Yeah. And the, no, you're not wrong. The character really doesn't serve a purpose any, any more than just being there specifically to have Christina Lindbergh in the film. And I'm very grateful that that's the case. Don't get me wrong. I thoroughly enjoy having her in this movie. But that being said, the love story stuff really does drag down the film. And that it is does. the sum it's, whole of my complaints. It feels like a lot of padding for this love story. It does because it takes all of the momentum out and it very clearly feels like producers just like, well, no, we need this in the film. People want yeah, a love story. Something. Yeah. Yeah. People need a love story. Right. Yeah. When And you could completely excise all the love story stuff, still have the characters interacting the way that they were. And then we just don't ever see them again. <laughs> Yeah. And like, we just assume that they're dead and we're only following Ocho, right? <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So and then we see Ocho is now hung up again, but she's using one of the mini cards to cut the rope. Now we see the president having a meeting uh, with his cabinet. Uh, the pimp has now taken over the shit stained spot. They're all talking about it. And then all of a sudden, tons of those little cards start dropping on the table. And then we see the boar one lands and a knife goes through it. And then Ocho comes down. Now she starts slicing and dicing again. At one point, she has one titty out. She She's kind of getting cut as well because there's a lot of them. And so then at one point, she's just doing this topless. She's getting cut as she's cutting. So she's getting injured. Um, this is another it, thing that we alluded to, but it's full-fledged here. These men are just yeah. attacking her and trying to kill her. Yes. And they're not waiting. This is so realistic. This is what I feel like you would... This is what a, this type of sword fight would be like. Yeah. <laughs> um, she... Um, is severely injured. Uh, the commish gets a good stab on her, and it's down the commission, the prez. Um, she's able to kill the commissioner, and she finally meets up in the same little torpor chamber to um, the president who keeps trying to shoot at her, but he keeps missing, and she's able to throw a sword. It stabs him right in the heart, killing him. Then she takes the gun and starts shooting the, his tattoo on his back. She goes out into the snow. Uh, I don't know if she's dying. I don't know what's happening, but she is very injured. She takes snow, rubs it, cleans off her tattoo, and we roll credits. finally went longer than just an hour talking about a movie um yeah man so basically there's more into this one than the last two and don't get me wrong i enjoyed the last two uh movies um uh, the, the, i thought they were good i thought this had more substance to talk about more story <laughs> and not just the action scenes which were better right but the whole thing kind of i don't know it was, a, it was a better story and how everything was kind of meshed together it's a lot more fun to watch as well uh lady snowblood yeah. really drags you down into her world and it's not fun at all dark not at all it's dark it's especially grim. in the second movie where anything she tries to care about dies in the second movie the similarities are there i mean the world is almost exactly the same the characters have yeah. the same driving through line but the big difference is ocho is not consumed by no. her need for revenge she, she lives her life and then finally the opportunity comes about to where she can do it. It's yeah. it's not that she hasn't been looking, it's just that she isn't so grotesquely obsessed with her vengeance and it's and she has friends. She has <laughs> Yeah, it's not the whole of she, her existence. She she has maybe not so much of a family of, in a traditional sense, but she had these people and and all these people while they were tortured for a little bit were set free and are still alive. She didn't lose everything. So even when she's done with her vengeance leaving in the movie, she still has those people out there. She, so, yeah, she didn't purposely, she's not like this, yeah. this demon of vengeance that uh, Lady Snowblood was turned into, <laughs> you know, that's, that's not the case there. Uh, yeah. That's kind of where the similarities really pretty much end. Um, yeah. I mean, even though it takes place in the same era, there's like an anarchist trying to assassinate a president who's clearly a wicked person. Um, the president in this movie sure is fuck reminds me of a former orange person that we had in office at one point it's mr fake spray Ugh. tan yeah a lot of stuff about the way that he reacted to things and how things were done in his regime and the fact that he's a fucking criminal to get him there yeah and i think you know something i've noticed about these kind of samurai type movies that we've been watching is they're bad guys they do a really good job of making these very gluttonous characters that can never just have enough in life whether it's alcohol drugs women food it, it power it, it's a good, vengeance power murder, yeah everything it's, a, it's not enough it's a it's a it's a good it's a it's an amazing 
um, it, it, an amazing turn. It, it's uh, what am I trying to say here? I'm getting kind of lost in it. Sorry. Uh, they're it's all be- they're all over. It's better me. than what I see in a lot of even modern day American movies of of a villain, except for our real life villains that we have in this you know in this world. These these characters are what villains are. They're gluttonous for everything. And they have no ability to be, they have no control of themselves for anything. So a lot of our villains are similar to how they're done in comic books where we glorify them, but also still try to tell, you, no, you really don't want to be this villain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a lot of that is happening in American films. And these guys, every single one of these villains in this particular film is very much just a vacuum looking to be filled with whatever sex, violence, power or money they can get. They're just empty. They're not even really human in that they're. They're really, really just like narcissistic, evil fucking pricks. And, yeah. you know, even our hero, who is still very nice and very kind and is taking care of Yuki and everything, even she, I mean, she was a pickpocket, she's a thief, but they're trying to be like, oh, she's a lovable, rakish rogue. You know, the real bad thing are these men in power. You know, like the yeah. the thing the movie's throwing out at us here, like is, I mean, it's weird to say this, but it almost feels like a feminist statement that they're doing with this movie. But they're also all this like nudity and like sex. <laughs> And rape in the film but at the same time pretty much nothing gets done in this movie unless a woman makes it happen yeah, one way no, shape or wrong. another like even the president's power was really kind of because of his wife and he resented her for that so he kills her I mean that's yeah. kind of what happened because she was really the one running the running the thing and making him think that he was you know yeah. like and you know every single one of them <laughs> I'm just really grateful that the woman who actually raised Ocho wasn't the one who caused her father's death the first time I watched this movie I was convinced that was the case Yes, me too. But yeah, yeah, it's just uh, I confuse the wife of the president and the woman who was running the hostel that yeah. Ocho was in. Uh, I just thought that the reason the women were allowed to stay there is because the president, you know, made this happen for his wife or, or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, I just didn't I totally didn't get it. I wasn't paying enough attention the first time that I watched it. It took me probably like the second or third time through when I was really trying to pay attention to the story and not just enjoy all the gore and the violence and the sex, which is the beautiful thing about this movie you can watch it on a surface level like being a shallow fucking prick that just wants to watch a lady carve up dudes nude yeah right <laughs> like i mean i know that for a fact you can you can watch that several times and still enjoy it on just that level because that was me it's probably about the yeah. third or fourth time is when i started paying attention to the story and became even more impressed than in love with this film <laughs> yeah exactly right yeah jesus yeah and honestly like the only thing i can think of as to why anybody would disparage this film or like get down on it or not even give it a chance or be dismissive of it is because of all the fucking that's in the movie all the sex yeah. and that kind of stuff and they're looking down on it on that and I say to you you are a fucking prude because there is no yeah. reason to look down on it for that I know sex th- happens people yeah the rape scenes may make you uncomfortable absolutely but there are plenty of other things in the Criterion collection that have a whole bunch worse rape shit in it yeah <laughs> <laughs> so you're just being a prude because the nudity makes you uncomfortable and you want to look down on the film. I think this film is every bit, every bit artistic and interesting and fun yeah. as you could possibly want. And it's just because it was made for an exploitation audience that people look down on it. And that is such fucking horseshit. And that's why we're here to champion it. <laughs> I agree, goddammit. That's what this show does best. We find those little weird exploitation gems that people have just somewhat ignored or just kind of looked down on, and we try to find a different way to look at it. And sometimes we can't, because sometimes it really is garbage. Sometimes it is that fucking bad. It is garbage. (laughs) Sometimes it really, truly is birdemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) But this is not one of those times. I thought this was a very well done movie. Yeah, so. I'm so fucking sad we'll never probably get this in a high definition print. Yeah. Like, I'm just fucking heartbroken. The DVD is the best we will ever get because this movie's fucking great and everybody should watch it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Jesus, I think so too. And we made it an hour and a half ish on this one, right. give or take. Uh, we'll see what cuts down in the dead spaces. Yeah. Uh, but well, let's well. let's do a news and we'll call it a night either way. Fucking A. <laughs> All right. We're going to take a break here. We're going to play the Geek Radio Daily promo in this bit that I promised myself I would stop doing, but somehow slipped back into to like a jump and then we'll have some more music i stole out of the film (laughs) are you having trouble keeping up with the ebbs and flows of modern geekery is the real world holding you back from knowing what is happening in the geeky world 
To answer these and other personal problems brought in by your friends, gaming group, and loved ones, Geek Radio Daily presents daily informational sessions brought to you by the wonderful Billy Flynn, the Flynnstress, and podcasting's Rich Siegfried. They contain such helpful segments as history, geek birthdays, box office results, the latest in DVD and Blu-ray, video game and comic releases. Why, they also have a Sweekly show hosted by the wonderful Billy Flynn and the Flynnstress, which includes interviews and commentary. And to make sure you are informed, Geek Radio Daily also provides you with your daily dose of geek news to make sure you know more than that jerk know-it-all Steve. Visit us at geekradiodaily.com. That's right, Geek Radio Daily. All the geek without the weight. Now available in fine Corinthian leather. in one of the sex scenes i think that's in the lesbian sequence right before it becomes a three-way that that music is that is that right is i that... think i think you're right i think so i i didn't mean to do that i mean i think i'm not complaining about it i i don't think i meant to do that like and not consciously i wasn't thinking of it when i grabbed that song i was just like this would be a nice peaceful interlude before we get some psyop news this story myself oh look at matt doing this by the way i've stopped putting those in the announcements so now i've just tagged you and put the hashtag psyop news okay <laughs> that's how I, you can find them from now on i i still found this story by myself well look at you being self-sufficient yeah i'm a big boy now <laughs> so anyway uh Alaska Airlines banned state senator for continued refusal to follow mask rules. Oh, you just wanted a soapbox, you fucker. Fuck you. America's a bunch of cunts. Well, that's that's true. Senator Laura Reinbold, a Republican of Eagle River, said she had not been notified of a ban and that she hoped to be on Alaska Airlines flight in the near future. I'm a cunt. Was that a general Alaska? Alaska Airlines has banned Alaska State Senator for refusing to follow mask uh, requirements. We have quoted, they said they we have notified Senator Laura Reinbold that she is not permitted to fly with us for her continued refusal to comply with employee instruction regarding current mask policy. This is Spokes not the sickness with which I am instead. He added that the suspension was effective immediately. Reinbold, a Republican of Eagle River, said she had not been notified of ban and that she hoped that to be on an Alaska Airlines flight in the near future. Last week, Reinbold was recorded in Genoa International Airport arguing with Alaska Airlines staff about mask policies. A video posted to social media appears to show airline staff telling Reinbold her mask must cover her nose and mouth. Reinbold told the newspaper that had been inquiring about a mask exemption with uptight employees at the counter. Your uh, cousin's super hot. You should be able to fuck one time. She states she was reasonable with all Alaska Airlines employees, adding that she was able to board the flight to Anchorage. Reinbold has been a vocal opponent to COVID-19 mitigation measures and has repeatedly objected to Alaska Airlines mask policy, which was enacted before the federal government mandate this year. I'm a cunt. Last year, she referred to Alaska Airlines staff as mask bullies after being asked to f- by flight attendants to wear a mask aboard the flight. America's a bunch of cunts. 
and I promise you there's a payoff to this. The newspaper reported, uh, after the incident, she reportedly sent a cake to some flight attendants bearing the inscription, I'm sorry if I offended you. Alaska Airlines has banned over 500 people. Thompson said the length of Reinbold's ban will be determined by review. It wasn't recently known how Reinbold, who was in South Central Alaska this weekend, would be able to get to Genoa, where legislative sessions resume on Monday. No other airlines fly from anywhere to Genoa except for Alaskan Airlines, and especially Anchorage to Genoa, which is the only way a flight would get to Genoa. And if she has to go, because Genoa is where you go to vote, and you cannot do that remotely in any circumstances in Alaska law... The only other thing could be a ferry trip, which will take several days. So this state senator effectively made it she can't vote any of her states anything anymore without a, a, a multi-day ferry trip. Put a quarter in your ass, you played yourself. Yeah, I got well, nothing. I don't even want to fucking talk about it. <laughs> you want me to do another one? Yes, please. All right. This one comes from our boy Robert. Robert. Our man in the field. May he not our let us down as our own selecting from Matt's eye up. <laughs> Assholes. God damn it. Uh, edgy man who stole the replaced women's shoes set free. Victims too disgusted to press charges. Oh, this one's creepy. A girl well, gets terrified enough. The only thing that's going to solve that is a cock. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I got oh, I got nothing for a shoe sniffer clip. <laughs> clip? <laughs> uh, a rare example of someone being below the law. About two weeks ago, a man in Nakuta City, Edgy, perfected birthday was arrested for stealing a pair of pumps that belonged to a music teacher. What made this theft even stranger was that when taking the shoes, he had replaced them with a nearly identical new pair. The ensuing investigation found a further 20 pairs of women's footwear in the suspect's home, suggesting that he had done this several times. I have a raging he, erection. He had also admitted to police that he had exchanged the shoes because he enjoyed the scent of the used ones. Man, that's just the worst hand job ever. <laughs> that's how things stood as of April 10th. But upon further investigation, new details are come to light about this thief's modius operandi. It turned out that the man would survey the shoe cubbies of his victim's workplace and then take photos so he could purchase a convincing pair of lookalikes. Then, after buying the shoes, he would break them in himself for a bit before making the switch so that hopefully the victim wouldn't notice. It would seem this new information proved too much for an initial victim to handle because the music teacher dropped charges against him, saying that the details of the case were too disgusting for her. Pulling it just she to was, pull it. She wasn't alone either. After her story broke, many other women came forward about their shoes feeling suddenly different and reported it to police. However, none of them were willing to pursue char pursue charges against the man for similar reasons. So they were just so grossed out by the fact that he was doing this that they're like, oh my yeah. god, he, this is how he lives. Like, we can't make yeah. it any worse on him. As a result, on April 23rd, the suspect was set free and will not stand trial. The police have also determined that he was not stalking any of the women themselves, just their shoes, so they will not see charges on those grounds either. Due to the nature of the case, it was difficult to get cooperation, said an officer. If that's what the victims want, then there's nothing we can do, but it's a shame because we put a lot of work into the investigation. I have the most confused direction right now. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Netzens were uh, amazed that this man will go unpunished, presumably because of what he did was so repulsive and insignificant that no one wanted anything to do with it. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's a lot of stuff going on there. So, that's he broke into their house to take the shoes? Or, no, work. He would go to their workplaces, and, and they all would have to take their shoes off when they go into the office, in their shoe cubbies. Then he would go, find the ones he liked, take pictures of them, buy a pair that looked just like it, break them in himself, replace the shoes, and then take the used shoes home for stuff. Oh, dude, for I completely forgot it's like a cultural thing for leaving the yeah. shoes outside of like a, you know, an, a certain living or area or whatever. I didn't, it didn't translate in my mind that that would happen in businesses as well, but that makes sense. Yeah. Yep. So he did it for a thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he did it for masturbatory purposes. It sounds like that, yes. <laughs> Man, that is just the worst hand job ever. Oh, 
I mean, it really is. The more you break it down and the more you think about it, it, it makes sense, right? Because like the main violation is he stole their shoes, but replaced them with exact replicas just so he could have the shoes and sniff them and for whatever. And it's yeah. like this, it's like this thing that they're, they're complaining about. Sure. But when they find out that this is the guy that's doing it and what he's doing with them, it's like the embarrassment of being a victim to this guy's kink. Cause that's all I can yeah. really figure it is, is just too much for them. So they, they're so disgusted by it that they're like, I just don't want to even be a so associated with it just let him go probably yeah and so this is how this guy's going to keep operating until his behavior escalates because soon stealing the shoes won't be enough of a thrill when they're already outside eventually he's going to get busted for something really bad and then they're going to have to do the charges but well he's if if his you behavior cannot force people to press charges so right but if his behavior escalates then it will get to something but if yeah. you're if you're if there's the thrill seeking element of this like getting the shoes the way that he is where he's stealing them there's a thrill seeker element to this that makes me as a person who has watched way too many serial killer profiling shows think that that risk taking behavior is a sign that if he continues to get away with it he may need to escalate because feeling won't be the same yeah exactly no you're you're you got you got it right there <laughs> some people though some people stay right where they're at where like just stealing the odd shoe out of a cubby and replacing it with an exact replica is kind of like that'll be enough for him you know that's a yeah. that's a very distinct possibility some folks are just voyeurs and they like to just you know watch yeah and that's just wrong. enough with them um there are some folks that are exhibitionists and they like to perform out in public for everyone and they like the idea of possibly getting caught that's why they go fucking in public bathrooms that they don't lock the door and stuff like that you know yeah that's what they're into and you know what cool for them but the, yeah. the difference is <laughs> they're not stealing shit from people they're not violating people's like trust and leaving their shoes behind somewhere like this guy yeah, i know right i mean in the end of the day it's someone's goddamn property you're still taking <laughs> right you're still stealing somebody's shoes and you're still doing yeah. it for uh, even if you're putting another pair there I don't have fucking Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like there's so much about this that just screams like a warning sign for possibly more extreme behavior. But that's in our culture, maybe in the culture over there. It's just he's just a sad, lonely guy and they feel so bad for him. They're just going to let him go. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I, I I don't see how that's the case, but. Yeah, but you agree with me, right? There's a sign yeah. that there could possibly be more. Uh, risk taking behavior in the future from this guy that's yes, all he's going to uh, learn from this definitely oh of course <laughs> all, right. all right well then i didn't get in trouble this time what, what's what's next <laughs> <laughs> matt and i are only speaking out of personal experience of two guys that have lived their lives by that coda i didn't get in trouble for it this time so what's next yeah, so what, what, what else do i gotta lose <laughs> <laughs> and that is the perfect note to end this show on so here we go yeah right if you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema Psyops, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Mean Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Go Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Witch vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com com itunes spotify stitcher youtube and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found
fucking shit. I got lost in it once again. Every fucking yeah. time with the music. Uh, I love the opening and closing themes. That's why I wanted to open and close the show with it. Sort of when we're going into the movie review. That's why I tried to do. I tried to get the beginning and ending music as yeah. best I could. And I subconsciously, for some reason, grabbed the sex scene with Christina Lindbergh <laughs> in it. Uh, where, where it's like the only sure. consensual sex scene she's involved in. It was an accident. It, yeah, I, it's subconscious. Sure. I, I don't I don't think I meant to do it, but, you know, who, who even knows anymore what the fuck is even wrong with my brain? Yeah, well, fuck it. Some of the best scientific minds have looked. <laughs> <laughs> and they're extremely confused. If you'd like to find a ton of other instances where I may or may not have grabbed music out of a porn scene subconsciously or blamed it on my subconscious when it was a very conscious decision, that's all available in our previous 297 episodes. Legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops. And a big kudos to our boy Mike for looking up and finding the longest run time time of our show i said it last week and i'm like does anybody actually do any of these little tasks well our boy yeah. mike actually did it you ready all right i'm ready our maniac cop full franchise fest episode the longest running time it was four hours 37 minutes Jesus Christ. Yeah. But yeah, I, yeah that was our particularly long winded. We had a ton of feedback and a bunch of other stuff. So, and uh, our fellow podcaster, El Goro, actually responded to some comments when I said that uh, Mike should go and listen to it. And uh-huh. he had stated that if your podcast lasts longer than four hours, seek medical attention. Oh, well, well I mean, not a bad idea. Uh, that's uh, <laughs> I don't think it's a proprietor. Yeah, I, I don't think that Goro listens to this show, but if he does, um, it, you may note that we did in fact seek a medical attention, and our show does not go near four hours now. No, yeah, yeah, nope. See, now we're we're much better. Yeah, that was a special show. That was like our fiftieth or whatever, and we had a ton of feedback and everything like that. I used to beg for feedback. I used to just like go around yeah. and like beg everybody to give us anything so that we could like. I just wanted to pretend like people listen to this show and cared about us but now i know we got robert robert will always yeah. be here for us so we got robert and he and he, he, he loves us <laughs> and of course all the folks in our facebook group at cinema psyops we know you're not there just for the memes we know you're there to kind of enjoy and share with the show and mike has proven that at least in his case for sure you know robert's always going to be there for us <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> so, you know, we, we've got listeners. We're good. We got our Facebook group, Cinema PsyOps. I'm there as Court PsyOps on Facebook. Matt is there as Matt PsyOp. But pretty much right as the recording's happening, during the recording, that's the only time he's really there. Really, that's about it. That's the only time I can be bothered with you people. So if you try to message him there, he won't respond. He also has an email, psyopmatt at gmail.com. You can complain about his news choice and how he was soapboxing, but he won't read it and he won't check the messaging on his Matt Psyop account at all. So don't worry about it. I don't know what you people want from me. I really, really don't. Participation, perhaps? That's all I'm asking. Oh, fucking Jesus Christ. Okay. You can email <laughs> feedback to court, cinemasyopscourt at gmail.com. Let him know that that really underhanded way that he guilt trips Matt is pretty fucking cool and I'm impressed. I mean, it, I, I, I have to admit something. It fucking works. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, it fucking should because it's the only thing I can do. I have to guilt you like I'm your mother. It's the only thing that works for you anymore is the guilt button from mom. It really does. Yeah, it's the only thing that's ever worked. I mean, I'm Catholic. It's it's the only Catholic guilt, man. That's it. <laughs> well, if you are Catholic and would like to take exception with this with Matt, <laughs> you can twit a couple of tweets on the hate-filled shit fest reformed as a porn bot heaven known as Twitter. He's at PsyUp Matt there and I am at Court underscore psyop and uh if you want to talk about pushing buttons and uh feeling guilty about it you should go over to instagram oh jesus i'm just saying because you know you know yeah there's all sorts of there's all sorts of buttons that are like liking photos over there that you can push yeah and then and then you feel bad about it later you could feel real guilty about it later Yep. looking at all those buttons to be pushed and everything and that's looking at all those buttons yeah but one of the reasons that you can like make an excuse as to why you're there is the meme repository that is us cinema underscore psyops there that is the page that i run that's where all the meme dumps go so like all those high quality memes yeah usually on a weekday like three memes a day give or take usually with a theme sometimes if i'm feeling right i'm trying to curate it there and uh yeah. it gets moved over to facebook as well and then also extended to twitter but that's the primary meme repository that's that's where you're going to find them all the easiest because there's episode release on Facebook that you're going to find really, really annoying and get in your way of all the memes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you always got to be worried about getting sucked. 
<laughs> I'm very careful not to be zucked. I try to follow the rules as closely as possible, but sometimes getting zucked happens, and when that happens, you just have to kick the fuck out of this week and make it your bitch. Let's see here. All right, start recording on your side. And I am recording. One, two, three. All right, do a little talky talk. Make sure the waveform looks good and that you're on your uh, whatever the fuck yep. that mic is. I'm on the, the snowball. It sounds dirty. Sounds yeah. like you'd like Everything to have worth- sperm spit back into your mouth after a blowjob. I mean, we didn't really have to say it like that. You could just, you know, did the innuendo, but that's fine. <laughs> there is no subtext in this show anymore. It's all text. <laughs> It's all just, we all just hammer it home with a sledgehammer. There's no nuance anymore. To quote and also impressionate Garth Marenghi, possibly the greatest horror author in his own mind. <laughs> I know tons of authors that use subtext, and they're all cowards. <laughs> of course, Garth isn't even a real author, but you knew that. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And you finally got the subs to work with the AVI file and the I, SRT? I totally forgot that that's what I had to do. Once you reminded me, I'm like, uh, it, it, it's not that hard. You just have to download the ST file, and then just when you play it through VLC, right-click and do choose the subtitle sub yeah, yeah, folder. It's, it's in the folder I shared with you, so. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not hard. It wasn't hard to begin with, so I just forgot to do it. Yeah. Usually if I put movies into a whole entire folder for you, there's a reason. So <laughs> There's a reason for it. Yeah, if a movie gets its <laughs> own folder, usually there's going to be an external sub that you're going to need from here on out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Probably. <laughs> I would say like almost definitely. So I'm not sure about next week's file because I just got it myself. So let's hope because we're going to announce that we're doing it and we already kind of did. So All right, fuck it. Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe I'll check it earlier rather than later. <laughs> <laughs> But there's a sequel to this that came out the exact same year within like a couple of months. One was like, I think the first one was like February. And then the second one was like, you know, June. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, uh, our main actress is in a ton of these kinds of films. Um, It's a uh, fun film. But like badass ass kicker stuff. So, I mean, I don't know, maybe this is all gone into outtakes. That's why I'm talking to you about it now. But, (laughs) But like maybe, just maybe we need to cover more of these kinds of films. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and not just the samurai variety, but like uh, these like kinky softcore sex films with lots of violence. This pinky violence shit is something that I can really get into. <laughs> I, trust me, I think there's a few things on here that would tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's stop beating around the bush and start the fucking episode then, all right? Yeah, yeah. Um, then she goes outside where it's a fresh snow. Snow's falling. She's kind of rubbing the snow, cleaning the blood off of her own tattoo that's on her. Um and uh, then we roll credits. Huh, that's weird. Let me hit that again, because I hit that really weak, too. I was going to correct you if that would have played right, so you're fine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway.
sometimes getting zucked happens, and when that happens, you just have to kick the fuck out of this week and make it your bitch. I had nowhere to end it with that. <laughs> That's about as good as you could get it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have stopped recording.